Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Jeff Layton, and I'm a uh, um, longtime developer of uh, Linux NFS. I've uh, been involved about a, for more than a decade. Been involved with Ceph for about three years now. And I've been working on a project to uh, allow Ceph to, uh, or allow exporting of Ceph over uh, NFS, but from uh, multiple server heads. Um, so first, I'll, you know, we've, a lot of you guys were probably in some of the earlier talks, but I'll go ahead and go over it. Um, you know, what, what are the pieces here? Um, we start with, you know, everything at the bottom layer is Rados, which is a, uh, a uh, re you know, redundant and distributed object store. Um, on, built on top of that is CephFS, which is a, a POSIX coherent file system. Uh, clients will uh, talk to, M to the, uh, it has a, its own daemon that runs on top of it, and it, clients will talk to that daemon to uh, acquire what's known as capabilities or caps, and that allow that, uh, uh, and caps are essentially pieces of delegated inode metadata. So you can get a cap to uh, allow you to um, uh, uh, read or write to a file, uh, fetch certain pieces of the attributes of it, uh, X adders, that kind of thing. Uh, and then on the t above all that, uh, we have NFS Ganesha, which is a uh, user land, uh, you know, all, all in user land uh, NFS server. And the uh, reason uh, we use that is that it's, uh, it's got a plugin based backend that uses, uh, that called Fasal Ceph. Uh, and we use it to, uh, and so it's pretty well suited for exporting uh, user land based file systems. Uh, we don't need to go through the kernel NFS server or do anything like that. Uh, and also, it has the ability to. It uses uh, the same. It uses a, uh, a libcephfs, which is a, uh, a Ceph based or a user land library that allows you to talk to Ceph without going through the kernel. Uh, and on top of that, we can also store uh, the recovery databases uh, and uh, config files in Rados too, which makes it well suited for uh, uh, um, containerization. So, sort of the goal I've had with all this is um, is to build be able to build a scale out. Uh, NFS server on top of Ceph, or CephFS in particular. Um, you know, what we want is we want to be able to, uh, people have had scale, or had NFS servers on top of Ceph for a long time, but, you know, being able to do that in a way that allows, where you can export from multiple heads at the same time is, uh, is pretty difficult, actually, because it's, uh, be able to do that safely. People will do that, uh, but if you have any sort of stateful uh, uh, objects, uh, locks, opens, that sort of thing, that becomes problematic uh, in, in the case of recovery. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea was we want to eliminate bottlenecks and single points of failure. Uh, you know, our, the goal is to sort of focus on uh, NFS v4 one plus because it has a lot of features that we make this, uh, make it um, better for redundancy and, and performance. Uh, the goal here is to minimize coordination between the Ganesha nodes. Um, so we, uh, you know, you can, build these sort of servers uh, if you are really, um, uh, if you're very uh, careful about recording lots of stateful information uh, on, in stable storage, but that becomes pretty expensive. Uh, so we want to have them be really loosely aggregated, sort of being able to do their own thing until, uh, until, they don't, until we need to have them reach out and talk to the other nodes. Uh, and the other thing is that Ganesha, uh, turns out, is pretty, you know, in this sort of configuration, is pretty amenable to containerization. We can stick it in a container. Uh, we, put all the, uh, we can put a lot of the configuration and recovery info into Rados. Uh, we don't need any real writable local storage or elevated privileges. We can run as non-root, so, so we can run in a rootless container. Uh, we don't need any third-party clustering, uh, like uh, you know, Corusync or anything like that, to talk across nodes. Um, and so we don't, uh, we, we can just use Rados to coordinate all that info. And we uh, are also, you know, unlike a traditional uh, active passive cluster, uh, a lot of those configurations, people will run, uh, will have two, you know, more than one node and will um, allow, uh, it will have the other node take over if this one fails. Uh, but we don't really want to do that here. With a container, containerized kind of setup, we can just reconstitute the node uh, instantly if it fails. Um, so the difficulty with all this is, is handling the recovery. Uh, so NFS is a little unique uh, in that, among network file systems, in that most NFS servers don't track um, 
uh, detailed information about what state is being held by clients on stable storage. So uh, most SMB servers do, uh, you know, for at least the more recent SMB versions. Uh, Ceph does for, in its MDS, it has a journal blog that it uses. Uh, but for NFS, uh, when after an NFS server dies and it comes back up, it has no idea of what state it has. All, it know, all we do track is what, uh, what clients we have. And so it's up to the clients to come back in and reclaim all their state they had before. Hey, I had this open. Hey, I had this lock. Um, so we do that by, when an NFS server comes back up after crashing, we do that by establishing what's known as a grace period. And that grace period, during that grace period, we don't allow any new state to be acquired. So you just, uh, if you try to do an open or, or acquire a new lock, uh, the server will tell you, nope, you know, it's, we're in the grace period. Uh, if you, um, so we only, but you know, in addition to that, we also have to be able to know because of certain edge conditions that can happen uh, during multiple reboots and, and network partitions, uh, we also need to have a, a, do need to know what clients are allowed to reclaim. And so we have to keep these uh, stable storage records uh, so that they know after a reboot um, uh, that they are, so that the server knows after a reboot that it is allowed to uh, reclaim. So prior to a client doing its first open, we get, uh, what we do is we set a stable storage record in it. Uh, so it, it, either a first open reclaim or a first open you know, regular, we set a stable storage record for it. Uh, and then after the last close, uh, we usually can remove that record. Uh, and the, and the, catch, the key here is that when we switch from, uh, from grace period, which is what happens right after a reboot, into normal operation, we have to atomically replace the old client database with a new one. Uh, and that atomically is very important because you know, failure could happen at any time. If we leave it, everything in a, in a indeterminate state, then that could be a problem after a reboot. So, um, so you know, a, a key uh, conceptual <laughs> Uh, way to think about this is that we can consider this as a set of, as, uh, each reboot is a series of uh, server epics. So we can start with a, so, you know, if, uh, you know, as clients perform their force, so basically for the first epic would be, uh, we have a grace period uh, when, when the server comes up and then it transitions into normal operation. You know, it crashes again, we go to another grace period, so that would start a new epic. And then we go eventually transition to normal operation, crash again, grace period. And we can actually have multiple crashes. If a crash happens during the grace period, we just stay in the same epic. So, <clears throat> so as the clients perform their first open, reclaim a regular, we set a record in, that, in the stable storage database for them. And then during a grace period, we allow clients that are present uh, to, in, in the previous epics database to reclaim. And anybody that wasn't in there gets refused. Uh, after, and after we transition to the, from grace to normal operation, we can delete any previous database that we had that was associated with the, new, or the previous epic. So where the difficulty comes in is how do we do this across multiple servers? Um, so you know, what does a grace period mean when you have uh, uh, um, uh, multiple servers? Because the, the danger we have is that when this server crashes or you know, server one crashes, uh, and as it's coming back up, we have to event, event, eventually kill off the old state that it held uh, with the MDS. And during that window, we could have another server race in and grab state that should be reclaimable by a client. So we have to avoid that at all costs. Uh, so really what happens is that, uh, um, so lifting grace, you know, if we can have to project this idea of a grace period across multiple, uh, um, across multiple uh, servers, we have to consider that the grace period is really a cluster-wide property. Uh, so in really, lifting grace period really becomes a, a two-step process. Uh, we indicate that the, you know, we have to first indicate that the local uh, server's grace period is over. He doesn't have any more clients that need to reclaim. And we also have to indicate to the others when we've uh, stopped enforcing the grace, grace period. And then, so the way we do this, uh, you know, another way to think about this is that we have, uh, we can consider as, as a set of two, two flags in a state, right? We have a, uh, a need flag. Each, each server in the, in the uh, 
in the cluster could have a, has two sets of flags. So we have a need flag, which tells it, um, you know, does this particular server node require a grace period in order to allow recovery? Uh, so the first node that sets a need flag declares a new grace period. So we'll transition into a new grace period at that point. And when the last node to clear its need flag, uh, the last node to clear its need flag can fully lift the grace period cluster wide and allow other, allow normal operation everywhere. So in order to, but we also need to know, uh, you know, you know, just saying you need a grace period is not enough. We have to actually know that all the other servers in this cluster are enforcing it before we can allow uh, uh, recovery to occur. So uh, we also have need a flag to say to indicate that a particular node is still enforcing the grace period. Uh, so if all of the servers are enforcing the grace period, then we know that no conflicting state can be handed out and the grace period is fully enforced. Uh, so this is used by the term server to determine when it's safe to clear its state on the MDS, on the, on the Ceph MDS. So and that really the, the sort of the basic idea here is we want, want very simple logic that allows individual hosts in the cluster to make decisions about the grace period enforcement. Um, people have done uh, active active servers before it was things like this too, but a lot of it requires uh, some sort of external coordinating daemon. Like, you know, uh, I think uh, IBM may have had a, a, a scale out server where they did something similar, but they needed a controlling node, but that also represents a single point of failure. And that and it adds you complexity. Uh, you know, if that controlling node fails, then you have to deal with the, you know, recovery of the, of the controlling node to handle all that stuff. So we want to avoid that here. <clears throat> we want the, the nodes themselves to be able to just look at the state of the cluster and decide what they should do. <clears throat> so basically, what we've decided to do is uh, the way we do this is that we do it within Ceph itself. Uh, we, we declare an object in, a, in a, just a single object in there that has a, just a little bit of info in it. Uh, we have it, we use that to coordinate our cluster-wide grace period recovery. Uh, you know, it's, Rados is pretty well suited to this because the compounds are atomic that it sends to do reads and writes. Uh, we could, uh, we, Currently, what we do is we do a, basically do a read op to slurp all the data off the off of the uh, object. Then we modify it in memory. Then we do a write operation to, if we need to change something. Uh, and then if the but if the write if if the object is changed in the interim, we'll just go back and redo the whole thing again. So we have a sort of a multiple polling uh, uh, method for this. <clears throat> uh, so all we need to really track for this is just a very little bit of data. So we have two uh, uint 64 t values. I used uint 64 t because who, who wants to worry about wraparound when we only have to track two of these things. Uh, the current epic, uh, which is where, you know, what database should we store new records that come in, you know, new records when, when clients come in. And then we also have a uh, recovery epic. You know, what, what recovery, what epic are we allowed to recover uh, or, or clients allowed to recover from? And then we, and we use, Declare r equals zero. To, you know the recovery of equal epoch equals zero means that the grace period is not in force. Uh, so, <clears throat> so basically, we store this in, this little bit of info in uh, little endian and unstructured data inside the shared grace object. Uh, beyond that, we also have an uh, an OMAP. We use the OMAP in the object as well, uh, it's, which is just a key value store, and we use that to store the the need and enforcing grace flags. Uh, so it's just a single, so we basically have a, uh, a node ID as the key, uh, and then we also have a, uh, the value is just a byte right now that uh, stores two flags, I and mean, it has room for expansion later if we ever need it for something else. Um, so in addition, uh, we can't just use a single set of recovery databases, we also need multiples. So we need one for each server, each node, and they, each node needs one for each epoch. So we, uh, store these in, uh, also in Rados objects uh, because Ganesh has had the ability to do this for a long time. And we just store uh, uh, the, you know, with the name of REC and then we have this, you know, the 64, uh, UN64T value here for the epic and then uh, the node ID here right after it. And this, uh, so basically, and in, inside that record, inside that database is basically just a, uh, a what's, uh, what NFS sends, which is a long form client ID string 
that uniquely identifies that client within the, within the uh, you know, among all the others. And so once, uh, so when we go from normal operation to grace without recovery, we, cut, we have to recreate the DB from scratch. So, uh, so sometimes if a, uh, uh, a node comes down, comes up, says it needs a uh, needs grace period, we have to, um, we, you know, we don't want the, uh, the surviving nodes to have to do any sort of recovery or to allow for any sort of recovery. We want them to mostly continue their operation, but we have to copy the records from one, from the old database to the new. As part of this, uh, we had, you know, in order to handle the manipulating and, and querying this database, we added a command, new command to uh, NFS Ganesha as well called Ganesha Rados Grace. And all it does is just a pretty simple command line tool. It allows you to sh see the current state of the cluster, uh, tells you what, uh, what epic we're in and what, you know, what the current recovery epics are, uh, what, uh, server, you know, what servers are known to, the, to be in the database and what flags they have. Uh, we can add and remove those, uh, those nodes from the cluster, uh, start a new grace period if we want, or lift the grace period so you can manip fully manipulate the database from the command line too if you like. Uh, mostly, under normal operation, you'll just use the add and remove and maybe the one to view it, the dump command. So to configure NFS Ganesha for, cl for clustering, uh, you know, we added this as a new recovery backend for NFS Ganesha. So, uh, mostly, if you, anybody that's using uh, Ganesha now with a, in a single node configuration, we usually have a, like a Rados KV or there's another driver called Rados NG. Uh, but for this, you, you would want a Rados cluster uh, to set that value in here. And, and, and by the way, this is just an abbreviated configuration file. It's, uh, you, you would actually have a lot more parameters in here generally, but I'm just showing the ones that are relevant here. Uh, and then in the Rados KV block, this is the block that tells uh, Ganesha, how to talk to the, uh, to the Rados cluster. And to, so what user ID she used to talk to the cluster, what pool, namespace, uh, and the node ID. So each, the node ID in particular is a pretty important thing. This needs to be unique on each node in the cluster. Uh, if you have collisions there, that could be very problematic. Uh, and then so once you set up the, uh, the config file in each Ganesha node, you just, uh, and then, you know, beyond this too, you would also have uh, export blocks that would show, probably export for exporting Ceph. Uh, it's, though it is, uh, this is, nothing in this is particularly tied to CephFS. Uh, you could use this sort of Rados uh, recovery backend with any uh, cluster file system, and it should still work, basically. Uh, but it is sort of, we've plumbed in a lot of other uh, mechanisms for uh, for Ganesha to be able to better manipulate the CephFS state, so it is the recommended way to do this. Oh, and also there's some requirements. Uh, this is a fairly, fairly new feature in Ganesha, so you need V27 plus. Uh, and then you want to, you'll also want a Nautilus or later cluster. Uh, you can do this on an earlier one, uh, but you'll probably find that um, some of the you may end up stalling, uh, and if you had particularly long outages of a node, uh, you could end up not being able to recover. Uh, so we, we really recommend uh, a Nautilus-related cluster for this. So <clears throat> how do we configure NFS Ganesha for clustering? Well, uh, we also need to do, you add it to the database, so we'll add uh, you can use the Ganesha Rados Grace command basically to, uh, and so in this case we're using Ganesha dash pool as the name of the pool, and then we have cluster A as the namespace. Uh, oh, sure, Lens. Are you using LibRados? Yes, yes, yes. These talk to LibRados. Uh, and also the same, same thing with, in fact, that's what, that's what this Rados KV block does, is we're, we're feeding it parameters for LibRados to talk directly to the Rados cluster and fetch objects and stuff. So, good question. Uh, so Ganesha Rados Grace will have to add each node to the, to the database. In this case, we're doing two nodes. So we have a node A and a node B, and that has to be unique. And then we just start, them up, start up each daemon, uh, and if they die, we want to restart them pretty quickly. Um, the reason for that being that uh, all of this depends on uh, the MDS preserving caps uh, that were held by a node uh, between it going down and coming back up. 
So uh, when, it go, when a node dies, we're basically racing against the clock. We have to know that uh, when, the, when the node comes back up, uh, that uh, any caps that it held before haven't been uh, fetched, or, you know, been stolen and, and maybe released. Uh, that's the, actually the worst case scenario, right? You know, if you had a file lock, let's say, for instance, uh, and, you're, and a node crashed, uh, and, then, and then that file lock got released while you were down, you come back up um, and someone else races in, grabs that file lock, maybe changes some data and releases that file lock, you come back up, you'll never know. And that can, that's silent data corruption and that can be ugly. So in any case, here's the demonstration. I'm gonna, can everybody see this in the back? Okay, great. So in this case, I'm running a cluster on my laptop in uh, Minikube. Uh, so Minikube is a, uh, a Kubernetes in a box, basically in a, in a single VM. Uh, so, and I'm also using what's uh, the using Rook, which is a uh, uh, operator for Minikube, or operator for Kubernetes to allow it to uh, uh, manage a Ceph cluster. So, in here, I've got three NFS servers. Uh, there's NFS uh, AA. A is the name of the cluster, and and A is the name of the node here. AB and AC. Uh, here I am on, on AC here, and I'm running the Ganesha Rados Grace command in a watch, under a watch command. So we'd see it, uh, the, the current epoch in this case is 23, and the recovery epoch is zero, so we're not in a grace period. Uh, nobody has a flag set, but you can see here's A.A, A.B, and A.C are the three nodes that are in the cluster. Um, so on this shell, I'm just going to uh, kick off um, some, uh, use FIO, which is a, a you know, performance benchmarking tool mostly, but I'm gonna use it here just to generate a bunch of IO. So we're just doing random reads and writes to, uh, to a file on the, on the Ceph share here through the NFS. So it's gener running now, well, maybe running now. Well, I don't know. Let me see if I can, I may not have survived my, <laughs> well, sorry, it was a good idea. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, let's see if Minikube will behave, no. <sighs> well, it was working a little bit ago. Maybe I can stop Minikube and start it back up. Basically, what I was going to show is that you could run uh, mini or you could run IO against the uh, a single head and uh, and watch, and it would be able to recover and come back. Uh, mini cube's not even behaving here. Here, well, in this case, I'll just stop. So. Um, Essentially what the demo was going to show is I was going to drive IO against one node and then kill off that node and you could see the IO go to zero uh, and then see it recover and come back up and pick right back up where it left off once the thing comes back. The other thing we've done too in Ganesha uh, recently is uh, taught it how to lift the grace period early if all the clients have come back and reclaimed their state. Uh, so that allows us to keep the grace period down to a, ver to a bare minimum, usually just a few seconds. Uh, once the node comes back up. Um, so, um, now, now that my demo has failed. <laughs> so caveats of future directions. Um, so all, again, all of this, you know, the caveat with all this stuff is that we are rely on the NDS holding the state for us for a client that has gone down. So a Ceph client that has died, um, when, when it dies and it comes back up, uh, we, we uh, the MDS eventually will time out at the, the old client's session. And so we need to, all the nodes to be in grace before that happens. Um, so we have to declare a new grace period. So on a clean shutdown, what we do generally is we try to, ship, try to declare a new grace period as quickly as possible. Uh, and then <clears throat> Nautilus also, one of the reasons I, we recommend Nautilus here is that it has interfaces to kill off the old session uh, and, and, and also interfaces to increase the session timeout. 
Uh, we want to be able to le le allow the MDS to uh, hold those caps as long as possible, as, as long as we need for the, M for the uh, NFS server to come back up and reclaim them. Um, you know, one of the future directions, uh, one, another future direction I didn't put on here, but uh, is that we also have some proposed interfaces too to allow, uh, not, or now allow Ceph clients to reclaim caps themselves. That would allow us to uh, allow, allow a node to die and come back without having to put everyone else into the grace period. Uh, and that could be, is a huge win. If we know, uh, if we know that a client goes down, comes back up, and that nobody has stolen his caps and that he can get to all his caps, we don't need to uh, enforce a grace period for everyone else. So uh, another problem we have too is that all these are loosely connected servers and to, the cl to an NFS client, they all just sort of look like individual servers. Uh, how do we distribute these clients among the cluster? Uh, can we use, you know, one of the ideas is that, uh, could we use a load balancer with strong affinity? And I have some real worries about doing that, so I'm not sure if that'll be something that's possible. Um, NFS v4.1 also has a, uh, a mechanism, an attribute called uh, FS locations info, which will tell the, which a uh, client can query so that it can know what, uh, where other locations for this same for the same export may be, uh, and so we would like to be able to allow, uh, we'd like to be able to f fill out this info uh, from the server so that it could, uh, so that a Client could so that if a node, a Ganesha node goes down, it can no, seamlessly migrate to another node, possibly. Uh, and then we also want to allow failover to a different head if one fails. So uh, that's a little trickier because right now all of our all of this mechanism relies on a client going getting back to the same node. That's why we like Kubernetes for this: is that it, uh, we can pretty quickly reconstitute the node from scratch, uh, you know, even from a read-only container image. Uh, and get back up and running quickly without having to try to do any sort of migration of the, of the state back and forth. And another thing uh, eventually we'd like to do is PNFS support. Uh, we would like to be able to run many small, run small NFS servers in each OSD, possibly. Uh, we, they just need to be able to support NFS v4 read and write, or NFS v3 even possibly. Uh, but uh, unfortunately right now the, there is no uh, PNFS layout type that allows for algorithmic placement. Uh, so we would need to have some way to be able to set to uh, inform uh, the, uh, the layout. Uh, one thing we could do is try, you know, one idea is just to go ahead and do separate layout segments, you know, and, and manually, but that gets pretty uh, unwieldy if, if for large files. So we really need some way to be able to say, um, you know, for to, to allow clients to determine algorithmically what, uh, where they should go to send their data. Uh, any questions? Sure, Lance. So, okay. Thank you again. Um, so this depends on the CephFS backend, right? It doesn't work with the S3 Ganesha. No, you wouldn't need to actually. Um, my understanding with RGW, um, is that uh, we don't really have any stateful objects. Uh, and so mostly what we're concerned with is locks and delegations. Uh, right now, uh, we, can, we have delegation support in Ganesha, but um, it is, um, uh, there's a problem with trying to run it across multiple heads. Uh, and I can talk, you know, I, you know, I can tell you about it offline, but, uh, but POSIX coherent locking does need, uh, need that so and I don't think RGW supports any of that sort of thing so I don't think you really have this you don't necessarily need this you can just stand up multiple heads independently for over RGW and you don't have any real problem I don't think limited, yeah. yes yes any other questions I guess I have to destroy okay well thank you guys sorry my demo didn't work <laughs> Thank you.